thank you for hearing our prayers today. And Lord, I just come on behalf of all of us, starting with myself, Father, I'm praying that we would be receptive to your word today, that we would be receptive to what you have to say to us today about suffering, and um, specifically suffering for the gospel. And so, Father, we just want to commit this time to you. And again, we ask that you would speak to each one of us, that, Lord, when we leave here today, we heard from you as individuals. I pray for that rhema word for each person, a word that you're giving to them that they know that's you and nobody else knows but you and them and myself included so we commit this time to you and we are trusting you that it is just that you speaking for your glory and honor and us hearing under your word and then going from there however you would have us to do it for your glory and honor as well in christ's name we pray with thanksgiving amen yeah, that's kind of an uh, interesting thing when the screens go out after you get, kind of get used to them after a while, don't you? Yeah, thank God we can still read and we still have Bibles and we still have print and um, all of that good stuff. So let's stand and turn in your bulletin, if you would, to page 11. We're going to have a scripture reading and we'll just read it together and it'll be there right there for you on page 11. It's a very, very uh, familiar passage to you. It's talking about the gospel or the good news. Paul sometimes calls it the gospel of the grace of God, if you uh, want to go there. It's good news about what Christ did, and then it's also good news about what cr God's grace does in our lives. And so we're going to be looking at that today. This is going to kind of be our focal point as we look at suffering. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, let's read it together. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the, all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Keep going. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. As I said, we are talking about a passage of Scripture that we just read that has to deal with the gospel. And you know this already. Bear with me. The word gospel means good news. Okay, good news. And the good news about the gospel that's listed here is that we as people on this planet can have our sins forgiven and we can be given life. Okay, have our sins forgiven and be given life through trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished work for us on, on behalf of us on the cross. So we receive these blessings not based on our faithfulness, but on Christ's faithfulness. It's all about Christ's faithfulness, and what our part is is to believe and to receive what God's Word says about all of this. And so it all comes to us as a gift through the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that. That's good news. I can be forgiven of my sins, and I can have eternal life by placing my trust in a person and what this person did, the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11 goes on to discuss, if you study it, a radical change in the Apostle Paul's life. Many people who have come against Christianity, many people who've been atheists, after studying Paul's life, says this has to be the real deal because this guy was so against Christianity, there's no way on this planet he should have become a Christian and then became arguably the top Christian of all time. It just couldn't happen. And so this gospel, this good news that he wrote about there in 1 Corinthians 15, it made a radical change in his life, okay? It also made a radical change in his service. I not only got saved, I was totally sold out, and I served God more than all the rest of them, 
okay? But he was a very humble man and a truthful man, but he's saying, it wasn't me, it was God's grace in me, okay? God gives you what you need to do what he wants you to do if you're willing to let him do it through you, okay? So he talks about this, my life was radically changed and there was a radical service, but it was God's grace. And so the risen Christ speaking through Paul wants us to really understand that, that it wasn't Paul, but it was Christ doing this through Paul, okay? Christ brings these gifts. Christ brings this grace. Um, it's all about God's grace. And so the risen Christ is letting us know through Paul, hey, it's all about God's grace. So we've defined grace in many ways. You've heard it many, many times from this pulpit. Grace means unmerited favor, getting something you don't deserve. We all know that. Grace is power and equipment for ministry. If your ministry is what God wants it to be, the power source and the equipment source is coming from Him. He is doing the ministry through you. We can do anything we want to do in our own resources. That's called flesh. God doesn't accept flesh even if other people applaud us and we think it's, it's a good deal. It's got to be Christ doing it through us. God's grace. So we have this grace, power and equipment for ministry. God's grace is another, has another nuance, and that is God's grace is sufficient. God's grace brings sufficiency. Break that down for us. Whatever you're going through, God will give you the grace to go through it. You have the grace to go through it. Whatever you're going through, you can get through it. You have a special grace for what you're going through. No matter who you are, no matter what's going on, God's got some grace for you to get through this, okay? He's got it, and so that's power and equipment and that sufficiency, getting through things. Another way that he just, just blesses us is it, grace empowers you to get things done, okay? Sometimes it's, it's just there's no way to get it done. But God's grace will sustain you when there's nothing else you can do to even get something done, okay? So let me rephrase that because I think I might have mixed you up. God's grace will allow you to get something done, but there are going to come times in your life when you can't fix it. You can't do it. You can't pull yourself up. You can't do anything. There might even come a time when you can't even pray. But God's grace will still get you through. Okay, you see that? God's grace will show up when you can't do that, and he might even allow you to still be able to do it by his grace, okay? So this is really, really important, okay? God's grace empowers us to do things. Sometimes it sustains us when there's nothing that we can do. So God's grace can calm you. It can give you peace. It can minister to you. It can have you live in a way that's beyond what is normal when you can't even figure out what's happening or is happening, and there's nothing you can do about it. Are you following? Let me give you an example. Um, our son, as you know, was in the war in Mosul over there in Iraq and that whole situation. They won that war and then they are uh, scheduled to come home and maybe get a little nicer time, maybe even come as far as the States possibly. Well, our son gave us a, a little notification. Um, yeah, he leads men and that's a good thing and a bad thing at times, isn't it? Okay, leaders have uh, greater responsibility sometimes, but they said, no, you're not going to be able to do that. We're sending you back into combat. So I said, um, my, son, my son sent a text the other day and he's been kind of working through all of that. And, and so he, um, he has a thing on his text that says, blessed up, you know? So I say, well, how's it going? And he sends a thing back and his text just says, blessed up. I said, well, could you do me this little favor? could you um, send me some details of what blessed up is looking like right now? See, you know, I'm trying to cultivate some relationship and dig in there because, you know, you know, it's not like they're going to tell dad all the details. And so he sends back, he says, dad, I'm driving a truck right now straight into ISIS. So grace, God's grace. How do you work through that as a parent as a mom without losing your mind. When people around you are expecting you to lose your mind, they're expecting you to be anxious, they're praying for you and they're still expecting you to be up all night with no sleep about something that you can't go deliver your son from. You can't go be with him, you can't go bail him out, you can't go hit him, you can't go whip him, you can't go cry with him, you can't go and do anything. God's grace can sustain you and empower you that you still sleep so well, you snoring so loud, nobody can sleep. <laughs> Are you understanding me? 
I'm exaggerating there. Are you getting the point? <laughs> that is God's grace. Are you following that? See, it's supernatural. It's God showing up. You don't have to be like everybody else. And sometimes saints, you know, you need to hear this and you need to hear it where it's thundering or whether someone's weeping. You are a Christian. Your life is not supposed to be natural. Your life is supposed to be supernatural. You are supposed to be different than everybody else because you serve Yahweh. Are you seeing that? Don't get me wrong. I did not say you don't cry. You don't have feelings. You don't go through grieving process. Did anybody say that? No, we did not. But God is with you no matter what you're going through. Are you following that? He's with you. And so we're talking about his grace here. I'm going somewhere. Hang in here with me. I'm going somewhere. We're talking about his grace, that his grace will give you um, what you need when there's nothing you can do about the situation. God's grace will show up, and you can have peace no matter what's going on in your life. This is, this is like a Christian's birthright. Are you tapping into it? Are you tapping into God? Being religious, just come in church, plan, won't get this. No, this takes vibrant relationship. This takes communication. This takes speaking the truth to God, being honest with him, and sharing your heart. This is what this, this, is what this takes. But it takes knowing what God has said because faith is based on what God has said. And God is going to react. God is going to move on what he has said in his word. So are we going to God, putting his word up in his face? This is what you said. This is what you said, a peace that passes all understanding. Where is it? This is what you said. God loves that. That's called living by faith. So grace ministers to us when we get some bad news and there's nothing we can do to change the circumstance. You know, nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. God's grace is present when a disappointment or many disappointments overwhelm us. Amen? Some of you are going through some disappointments. You know, we know. You know, we know. You've got disappointment, then you got another disappointment, then you got another disappointment. You're overwhelmed by disappointment. God's grace is sufficient when there's nothing you can do about the disappointments. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient, saints, when your hearts are broken and your circumstances are just too much to bear. I can't... I can't take any more of this. I just can't take any more. God's grace is himself. Yeah. He is sufficient. Yeah. He is our sufficiency. God's grace, as we tie it into what the movie's all about today, is sufficient when we're going through suffering. Okay, when we're going through suffering. And so we understand now, and stay with me, suffering is a part of this life. Since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there's been suffering. There is suffering for everyone of some sort, okay? Suffering is part of this life. But you have to understand, there's another type of suffering that comes into play in this life when you have attached yourself to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. There is a suffering that comes with the gospel that other people don't suffer without the gospel. Okay, are you, are you following that? That's what we're talking about today. So as we're getting into this, we could go through a lot of different places. We could go through a lot of different um, topics in a way. We could talk about trials, okay? Temptations. Temptations are a solicitation to do evil, okay? A trial is something that kind of comes your way. Maybe it's your fault, maybe it's not, but it's bigger than you are. Trials are in our lives and come into our lives to show us that we need God. We're not big enough to handle this. We need God. You've been at this church all these years. I don't mean to insult you, but you know we hear these things that God will never put more on you than you can handle. That's a lie. A trial is designed to put more on you than you can handle, so you cry out, Yahweh, I need you. Okay? But God will never allow somebody or something to tempt you and to solicit you to sin more than you can handle. But a trial, oh yeah, they're always going to be more than you can handle. I hope you know better when you hear that quote, don't be mean to anybody, don't insult them or anything, but you need to understand trials are always going to be bigger than you can handle. But James says, you know what, when they come your way, don't, 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 don't resist them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Why? We've said it so many times, because you can become all of that spiritually if you handle trials the right way. 
You receive them and let God do what he would like to do in and through your life through the trial. So then there's suffering. Um, things happen. Some babies are born sick. People die. There are things that happen. There is all kinds of suffering in this world, okay? But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about a, a very specific suffering. And I want to remind you, I'm not saying you don't know this, that as you read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11, it talked about the gospel. I'm here today to let you know there is a suffering that is married to the gospel that we're talking about today. So we're not talking about trials, temptations, and other types of suffering. We're talking about a suffering that's married to the gospel. So turn in your Bibles now, or turn, yeah, it has to be your Bible today because it's not on the screen, okay? So there's a Bible in front of you, a pew Bible there if you need to grab that. And I know you probably brought your Bible, and you can pull your phone out if you're going to get your Bible on your phone. Okay? So we are going to Philippians chapter 3, verses 27 through 30. And our point is, we're going to talk about this. We're talking about a suffering today that is attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter, what did I say? Three. I said three. Actually, that would be chapter one. I'm sorry. Okay, chapter one. I need to make a note here. Philippians chapter one. Okay, Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to just read it myself today, okay? Okay, here we go. Philippians 1, 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Okay, as we get into this, we're talking about suffering and the gospel. Philippians 1 there, verses 27 through 30, teaches us that this same gospel that we were talking about, it's going to Somewhere in there, it should, for sure, affect our conduct. Affect our conduct, okay? It should affect our conduct. This gospel that we read about, it should affect our conduct. It affected Paul's conduct, didn't it? It turned his life upside down. It turned his service to God upside down. This particular gospel from the text we just read, it's going to attract some enemies in the spiritual realm. It's going to attack, um, excuse me, attract some enemies in the spiritual realm. When you weren't involved with this gospel, you didn't have the same kind of relationship with the enemies in the spiritual realm as you do the day you accepted this gospel, okay? There's a, 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 a reaction that's going to come in the spiritual world, world, in the unseen world, when you accept this gospel that you would never believe that you would never believe. You are now on the hit list and we're gonna do everything we can to destroy you. That's what happens when you attach yourself to this gospel. These um, spiritual beings really get busy, okay? They will motivate people, they will animate human beings to now become, from this text you saw the word, your opponent. They will now become your opponent. We don't like how you smell. We don't like how you look. We don't like anything about you. And the bottom line is because we don't like your attachment to Yahweh or the Lord Jesus Christ. War is de now declared on you as an individual. Got to get this. We got to get this. This gospel we're talking about, it brings some suffering. And the thing is, is that these spiritual beings will motivate and animate human beings to be your opponent. And those human beings hate your guts and are going after you, and they don't even know why. They don't even know why. It's just the thing to do, okay? And so they become your opponents. And then what this text is teaching is that from there, this can result for you as a Christian in suffering in your life suffering in your life okay verse 29 of our passage states that this suffering is part of the christian life some people think that all it is is you believe and you go about your happy life no no it's a you know it's a thing there it says it's granted for christ's sake not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake okay um, believing in christ and suffering go together 
Mm -hmm, I'm still waiting for the amen. You, you, did you write that in your Bible? Am I preaching out of the wrong Bible? Did I make that up? No, no, what does the verse say? It's granted to believe in him and to suffer. Believing in Christ and suffering go together. Verse 29, for, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. We break verse 30 down this way. Suffering and conflict are part of the Christian life because of the gospel that we're talking about. Suffering and conflict are part of it. You, 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 you come from a church that say, you, it's all, you know, you're not supposed to have any problems, any suffering, there must be something wrong with you. No, that's just Christianity 101. Christianity and suffering go together, okay? God, he, he really does have some mysterious ways. He really does. And why do I say that? Because in this same book, chapter 3, verse 10, this book of Philippians says somehow that suffering and knowing God go together. People who are going through suffering have the potential to get to know God deeper and more intimately. Okay? So Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, and it talks about the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So Philippians 3.10 is saying somehow God does this, that suffering can be used to get to know him better. You already know that. You already know that knowing God is the most important thing in life. You already know that. And so suffering can aid us in getting to know God. If you look through your Bible, you just look closer, closely, excuse me, you'll see great men and women of God in your Bible walking through it, those who have suffered greatly because of their relationship with God. Why did Daniel get put in the lion's den? Why did the folks go in the fiery furnace? Why did they boil the uh, Apostle John in oil? Why did they put people in tree trunks and um, saw them in two? And, you, you know what I'm saying? That's beyond suffering. That's martyrdom, right? And so we're talking about this, but look at those great people of God and see that you don't see they suffered. Okay, they suffered. And so they suffered, why? Because of their relationship with God. Okay, because of their relationship with God. Suffering, put it the other way, these people suffered because of their relationship. Suffering goes the opposite. Suffering has produced some great men and women of God. They were going through something, they put their faith in God. The suffering actually made them greater for God. Suffering is like puppy love. It's real to the puppy. You see what I'm saying? And it's different from, for everybody else, and you can't tell somebody else what's not suffering and, and what it is because you're, you're wired different, okay? We're all different, but it's, it's like puppy love. It's real to the puppy. I watched a video last night. It uh, was very interesting, and it shared suffering that is going on around the world um, for Christ's sake in places like Somalia, uh, places like Russia, uh, places like China, okay? And so it's, it was just, just mind-boggling that, that people were beaten, people were tortured, um, people were put in prison, like, you know, well, we're going to start you out at a minimum of 17 years, okay? They were put in prison, okay? They had death, and listen to it. It was only because of the gospel of Christ. They heard they were having Bible study at their house. They go drag them out and they put them in prison. And there was one example where the man was in prison and he didn't have a Bible, he didn't have a friend in the world. They took this man, because he was reading his Bible to his family, took him and put him in the prison for all the murderers, the rapists, everybody that they didn't want to have anything to do with in prison, they put him in that prison. Okay, that's where he went because he believed in this gospel we're talking about. And then the brother didn't have a Bible. Nobody came to see him. It isn't anybody from Berean talking about prison ministry. We're going to go visit you. Oh, none of that. Nothing like that whatsoever. So he would get a little piece of paper, tear the little piece of paper, get a pencil, and write verses in there. Write verses. Uh, you know, get the gospel, write the gospel there. Um, Christ died buried. He was doing all that. And then he tried to save it. He couldn't do much, so he put it way up on the, the post there in his, his cell. The guards would come in, look around. Oh, writing Bible verses again. Pull that down and just beat him till he was almost dead for that. Tear it all up. That's why you're in here. That's why you're never getting out of here. You and your God. And, that, and then beat him half to death and, and go all over again. This is suffering, okay, in some of these other nations. We've got to get this. It's, 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 it's deep. Listen to this. And it's generational. 
Okay, listen to me. So what it looks like is, if I were to go through that hypothetically, what happens is my son Joseph goes through that and he ends up in the same situation I am because of the gospel. It is expected that if you believe the gospel or your parents believe the gospel, I'm going to end up just like my parents did. I'm either going to end up dead or in prison, beat half to death, maimed, or whatever the case may be. It's generational. We know growing up as Christians that suffering is going to be our way of life. Listen, saints, stay with me now, stay with me. In other countries, this is how it works with them. I heard it, I heard the quote myself. Hey, do you get excited and go overboard when the sun comes up every day? Are you surprised it comes up? Well, no, no, we appreciate it. Well, where we live, persecution is like the sunrise. We expect persecution to come every day till the day we leave here. That's where they're living, starving to death, getting beat half to death. All of this, your family getting killed because you believe 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. It's suffering. Are you getting it? And the thing is, is that these people have such a different mindset, they're like, no, it's not in vain. It's only in vain if we don't share the gospel. It's only in vain if we don't share the gospel. And saints, hear this. Hear this, hear this, because at the end of the day, the question that they ask and that they answer is this, is Jesus worth it? And they lose everything. And they say, Jesus is worth it. Amen, are you following me now? Are you following me? We're talking about suffering. So listen to this now, listen to this. They are not free, they are not free, they are not free, to share the gospel, but they do. Listen to me. But we are free to share the gospel, but we don't. Statistics were given in this video I watched last night that nine out of 10 Christians do not share their faith. That's a high percentage, and nobody's gonna blow them off this planet for sharing it. Nobody's gonna take them to prison. Nobody's gonna beat their wife. Nobody's gonna do any of that. But we don't share our faith. We're bold and courageous and animated and spirited in church, in holy huddles. But share your faith outside this door. We're not going to do it. Nine out of ten of us are not. So in these two to three pews, only one of us is going to share our faith when it gets down to it. Are you hearing me today? We're talking about suffering, right? We're we're talking about suffering. So this message today is tied to suffering. This is a suffering tied to the gospel. We're all going through different types of things, but we're not talking about that today, another sermon. This is sermon, um, uh, excuse me, tied to the gospel. Suffering because of the gospel. God gives the grace. God gives the power. God gives the equipment to go through it. And that grace is himself. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, 1. Are are we getting this? God is able to use suffering to deepen our relationship with him. Okay? Are you you grabbing a hold of this? We're in a very interesting place. So here's where we got to go. Please don't be insulted. Who do you think really has the deeper, more vibrant, living relationship with God. The man who's getting beat in prison for 17 years every morning because of his Christ, who's not free, who's persecuted, or the average American who's not persecuted, who is free, who's not suffering for Christ. Folks, it hurts us to a certain extent. We got to be careful but they are probably in a deeper relationship and intimacy with God than we are, than we are. Are you seeing? If someone were to blow our brains out for coming here to worship, how many of us would really be here now? You see, if it cost us, if they say, I'm going to kill your wife, Ron, I'm going to kill your kids, that's what they're going through. You still want to worship Yahweh? You still want to worship him? And folks, it's so deep in this, uh, these other countries, listen to me now, that one man went with his, one, young, one little boy went to the prison with his mother. His dad was so bad off, they had to carry him out and he didn't even know where he was or anything else. They had been beating on him so long. His son is this big, his son's crying, Daddy, 
I'm proud of you. You have not, you have not denied Jesus Christ. But before he ever got in that situation, he said, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to end up. But I hope that if I ever hear from you guys again, you stood for Jesus Christ. They're raised to stand for Christ in the persecution. And so daddy's there laying out there in the yard. They let him visit, okay? Let, let the little boy and the mom visit. They had to carry him out, threw him on the table, and the little boy's crying, Daddy, you're doing it. Because he already knew, I have to grow up and do this too. We're, we're proud of you, Dad. And the wife tried to slip the man a little New Testament. Okay, this is truth. This is not, this is not comic books. This is not superheroes here. It is superheroes of a different kind. Supernatural. Wife tried to slip a brother. He's, he's all inebriated, all beat up, and tried to slip him a Bible. The guard saw it, came over there, beat on him, did some more stuff, and said, you know what? If I killed him, beat you, and killed both of you too, I'd get a recommendation and a, a, a promotion out of this. This is why he's the way he is. Your God and his word. That's how they're living. Who do you think has a deeper relationship? What, do, you, do you wonder? Now, we got to be careful here. You know, God has us here. We don't have to apologize for where God has us. Just be where God has you and be all that he wants you to be. But are you understanding what I'm saying? We're cozy. We had a leadership meeting yesterday. <laughs> Funny. Temperature in the building. Too hot, too cold. Imagine never having any heat or nothing to eat, period. You know, that's us. We're spoiled, aren't we? Too hot, too cold. I still want cushions on the pews. That was a joke, you guys. <laughs> you see my point, though, okay? So I better hurry along and wrap this up. This is where, what we're talking about. Suffering for the gospel. Would you agree that it's probably foreign to most of us? It really is. You know, we ain't gonna go where we went last week, but everything's optional, comfort zone. You know, we, we talked about that already, haven't we? We're not into suffering for anything, are we? No way. We're not into suffering for Jesus or Yahweh either, if we're really honest. Amen? But that's why we're here, right? Get his word, right? So we can go on with him. So we're wrapping it up this way, just a quick illustration. You remember Charles Stanley, you got, you've heard of him, right? He had some tough times. Uh, uh, one of our members said, hey, he, uh, hey, why don't you listen to this particular program? I did, and I listened to three of them, you know, and he was talking about early years in the pastorate. And all that he went through, and somebody came in from the uh, Don, if I could say it, even the deacon board, and walked up here and then hit him, hit him in his mouth, and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's just a whole different world. Yeah, hit Charles Stanley. So there was an old lady in the church. You know, old ladies are always wise. Old ladies can tell you a lot about them the heater and the heat too. <laughs> early, early in my career, they, they helped me understand some stuff because I, people was always sleeping out and I'm like, ah, what are you doing sleeping? And you know, it's like, when the old lady said, around, let me, pss, 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 come over here. <laughs> old ladies can teach you a whole bunch if you're willing to listen. So the old lady said, Charles, would you come home with me? And I'd like for you to come visit me. I'd like you to see some art I have up on my, on my door, on my wall. So he goes into this old lady's house and she says, take a look at this painting and tell me everything that's in this painting. And so Charles Stanley is looking and he's having a tough time in the ministry. It's been tougher than it's ever been for him, going through some tough times. It was a painting of Daniel in the lion's den. Probably one you've seen. And Daniel's there in the lion den and a lion's den and all the lions are around and there's a hole at the top and there's a beam of light coming down. And he's standing there like that. And she said, Charles, tell me everything you see in that painting. Well, I see the lions and he told him how they, how they were, how they looked. And he looked at Daniel and told him, she said, are you telling me everything? Well, I see Daniel's clothes, I see the surroundings and, and all of that. And so he said, I told that lady everything I could think of uh, in that lion's den, in that picture. She said, Charles, there's one thing you're missing. Daniel is looking up, focused on God, not his circumstances. He's not looking at the lions, he's not looking at the cave, He's looking at God and his circumstances. When we go through this suffering, folks, we have got to be looking up toward God, not our circumstances. Not our circumstances, okay? We gotta look at God. Michael opened up the service, Isaiah chapter 40. Did you hear about this big God? 
that the whole earth is just like a speck of dust to him. Keep looking at this God who is the biggest God instead of your circumstances. Are you, are you following that? And as the worship team sang this morning, you know, lift him up. We need to lift this big God up in praise and in thanksgiving and in worship. We need to stay in communication with him. You sang about praying today, okay? You sang about that. We need to stay in communication with him the best that we can. And when we can't pray, and there some, comes some times where stuff is so messed up, you can't even pray, you need to what? Call somebody to pray for you. Just like we sang this morning, somebody prayed for me. Somebody had me on their mind. Ask somebody to pray for you. Then get back into this word. It's always about this word. What did God say in the word? My spirit prays for you. He said in this word, and there's all this warfare and all these spiritual beings, Romans chapter 8. Jesus is praying for you, and he's not looking up. He's looking down. Through the warfare, he sees it all. He is exalted to the place where nobody can mess with him or change his mind about what he wants to do. He is exalted. He has been exalted to the highest place there will ever be, God's right hand. So he's looking down on the warfare that's in heavenly places concerning you. Are you saying that? These are just some things we need to do. Get your mind focused in the right place, okay? Pray, do that. Remember, God the Holy Spirit's praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. And remember, oh, that song sounds so good, but it's so practical. Remember, to keep loving God more than anything. More than anything. See, we got to get it. Those folks over there love God more than their very life. You see what I'm saying? We love our cars more than God. We love our, our clothing more than God. We love our money more than God. No, no, they're saying we love God more than our life. If you kill me, I'm just getting there early. Bring it on. We're not ready for no suffering, are we? Well, we better get ready. Are you following this? Okay, so stay focused on God. And you know what? You got to get this. There is no comparison with God. There's nobody in his class. There's no one to compare him to. And then he tells you, and you need to get your head on straight, my brother and sister, my child, that this stuff that you're going through, even if you lose your life, you're maimed, you're burned, whatever the case may be, it is nothing compared to the glory I'm going to give you for going through it. Are you seeing that? Oh, I'm going to be blessed for going through this. This is terrible. I hate this. But God is going to give me a glory going through this the right way. I'm going to become all that spiritually here, but when I get there with him, I'm going to be somebody that's walking around that somebody wants to be like me. Look at all the glory. Why so much glory? Why is that person so high ranked? How much authority do they have? Why? Because they suffered much while they were there. And they stood for me, they didn't run, they didn't hide, they let me be who I wanted to be in them. They looked at their sufferings and their trials the right way. God, how are you want to make me better? I don't want to get bitter. Do you see? Oh, they'll be glorified. They'll be what? Won't be nothing wrong with it either. See, it pays. This whole thing pays. You're going to get a payday. I'm going to get a payday. Where do you want your payday to be? A little clapping, a little bit of stuff here that you leave behind, or people clapping and applauding you, God, for all eternity for the investment you made while you were here. This is investment time. What are you investing in? Who are you investing in? Is it just this little 70 to 100 years you're going to get, or are you investing in all of eternity? This big God, he pays. He's keeping the books. He's going to glorify us as we go through suffering because of this gospel. We're blessed today. We close it this way. Today, I've been up here. I don't know how long I've been up here. Probably too long. But do you realize that somebody, when I came up here to start this sermon, was suffering greatly. Somebody died. Somebody watched one of their relatives get killed. Some man somewhere had to watch them kill his wife and his kids for the sake of this gospel while I was preaching. Somebody is grieving. Somebody is crying. God, why? Lord, Lord. Because they went through suffering even unto death while I was preaching this morning. They went to eternity. They went to see God in that sense. Our suffering's real, it's painful. But even still, when you put it in light of what we're talking about today, don't you think that you might have something to be thankful for here today? Did you have something you can find to thank God for? Do you have something? The Word of God to be announced today. Suffering for the sake of the gospel. We need to think about that. Let's pray.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you for helping us with our perspective. Thank you for your many, many blessings in our lives, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for today. And Lord, we know there's a, all kinds of things going on in our body and friends of our body, family of our body. We know all of that. But today we're looking at just the suffering for the gospel's sake that our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through all over the world. Father, help us to uh, really keep this all in the right perspective. And Father, grant us to be grateful. And uh, Lord, just enhance our relationship with you um, to, to really understand that suffering and the gospel are, are tied together. So Lord, um, we don't know what you're calling us to do. We don't know what the future holds for us. Uh, we are in a culture that is um, uh, making Christianity the bad guy. No one can really cut your head off per se, but they're doing it in a lot of other ways, and it seems like we're working toward getting there. And so, Father, I just pray that we will be people who stand on your word, that, 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 that Lord, as important as your word is, that we have a vibrant, living relationship with you. So, Father, when those times come, we know you're real, and we know you're worth it, and we're willing to pay the price, and we know that it's not I, like Paul said, it's the grace of God with me. And so, Father, thank you. We'll have everything that we need when we get there, but, Father, grant us to choose. Grant us to choose with our will to do it your way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.